All right, welcome. You're here. You made it. It's afternoon, Monday, day one. Usually by day... Ooh, yes! All right. By day one, I'm usually totally exhausted uh, already. I've been here since Saturday, and we've been doing all sorts of events and walking around the river walk. And, and so after this, I'm going to go and just take a nap and kind of try to digest everything. Um, we're here uh, to learn about some of the stuff that you might not know that Google could do. So thank you, first of all, for being here and letting me share with you. Um, hopefully, most of us are educators, right? Uh, yes. And it doesn't matter what we do. As long as, you know, if you help someone or show someone or you say you work Twitter, then you're an educator. You just tell people, you know, you, you add value to their lives. And uh, that's what I thrive on. My name is Andreas Johansson. I'm from Ohio. Uh, originally, I'm from Sweden, so you'll hear me harp on the, uh, the, uh, the metric system later or, you know, sort of the big thumbs up for the metric system. Um, I'm a uh, director of technology integration and curriculum at a school district called Kenston. We are in Ohio, Northeast Ohio. We're kind of a small district, 1,200 people or so. Prior to that, I was a technology consultant at a county facility. And prior to that, I was a high school teacher. And prior to that, I did software QA, which was not awesome. So I don't recommend that. Uh, I'm also a Google certified trainer. So um, I have done a lot of Google training. I know, uh, I feel that I know a lot about Google. So if you want to stop after the presentation and chat, uh, feel free to do that. Because I'm going to go through some of this stuff kind of in uh, rapid fire succession. And uh, I'm going to share all of it with you so you don't have to write it all down. It's all shared already. I think it's out on Twitter. And, and you'll be able to get the whole presentation and then most of the resources that are associated with it including information about the mantis shrimp. And if you don't know about the mantis shrimp, we'll get there. So I see some people nodding. OK, maybe not. All right. So here we go, 30 things you didn't know. I'm going to start out with search. What can I do with search? Because Google is uh, synonymous with search. Where I come from in, the, uh, in Sweden, they try to make Googling or ungoogleable a word. And Google had a real issue with that. They said, we don't like that you're putting that in your dictionary, ungoogleable. Uh, most of us will probably Google ourselves, and we're going to Google some other stuff today. But what can I do with search? So number one, a lot of people miss it. You can do voice search nowadays, and that's been a, around for a little bit, and now it's even better. So they just released a new version of the voice search, and uh, it'll even talk back at you, just like Siri, but a lot better. I don't know what her name is, but uh, she seems really knowledgeable. And so you find it right there in that search bar. You click on it, up comes the speak now, and you just talk at your computer, which I think is really awkward still. Um, and Google will find the result for you and then read it back to you. And here's the cool part, right? You and I are all adults because I think you have to be about 17 or something to even be here in the conference center. So most of us are adults. But you ever look up a word and you don't know how it's spelled? And what good does a dictionary do to you? It doesn't, right? And me being a, a foreign language person, right? I, English is not my native language. I've done a lot of sort of look up and how is this spelled and stuff like that. But think about your second grader. Think about your second grader who does not know how to spell uh, bilingual or whatever my, the word might be. But they know how to pronounce it. Tell it to Google. You know what Google will do? It'll say, hey, here's what I think you meant, even though it, you might not find the exact word, right? Because it'll do that autocorrect. Now, here's something else I'll do for you. I, uh, I'm not going to demo it up here because sometimes Wi-Fi isn't really working well, and we'll see what happens going through. So what you'll see is some sort of screenshot that I've put together, and I've tried to make them as recent as possible, and I've geared them towards San Antonio. But if you type this stuff in that you're going to see in the next couple of search examples, you'll find very similar stuff. Movie times. Uh, how many of you uh, go to Google, and then you type in the name of your movie theater, and then you maneuver to the movie theater website, and then you search again? for the internship or whatever it might be, Transformers 43, and then you find information. Well, if you just put in movie name and then your zip code, and look at the brackets there. See those square brackets? You don't have to type that in. That's just sort of what you, you would give Google. And uh, sometimes I find that when Siri came out, a lot of people didn't even know what to tell her. Uh, right? And you still have to talk code a little bit. right? But if you just type in your movie name and the zip code, here's what you get right in the Google browser itself. So you don't have to go to the second or third website. It just brings it up for you. So I just did the internship, San Antonio. There it is. It'll show you the show times uh, from where you are. Right? Do you ever think about that your device knows where you are? Does that freak you out sometimes? Find pizza. Oh my God, how do you know I'm here? Um, 
You could turn that stuff off, but remember, all of our traffic goes through the NSA, so it doesn't really matter, right? It's, you just forget it. So I'm okay with privacy. Like social security, no, I just share it all. It doesn't matter because it's already out there. And then on the right, it'll build this little dialogue box for you. It'll show you a little bit more information about it. Clearly, this Google movie is, doesn't get very high ratings yet, but it'll bring up some information, who are the actors, and so on and so forth. And then you can keep maneuvering, right? Who has not been on Wikipedia? Okay, good. All hands should be down, right? And Wikipedia is famous for having the links everywhere, right? It's cross-linked and stuff. And so Google does that for you. So if you want to keep going, right, you can do that. But you don't, certainly don't have to. Population. I like to find out a lot about stuff where I'm going. And San Antonio is one of the biggest cities I've ever been to. I grew up in a fishing hamlet in Sweden. 600 people. I went to school with the same 30 first through ninth grade. That's where I'm from. And then we moved to Ohio and Stowe and... 30,000 people, and that was big, and then San Antonio. San Antonio population, 1.36 million people. See what else it does? This is right in the browser, so it's not, you don't have to go to a second website. Pull it up, and then it compares it with Dallas and Houston. We all know and love the Common Core. What's one of the core skills that kids need to do? Compare and contrast. So how does the population of San Antonio compare to that of something else? And Google kind of just gives it to you, right? Now, notice here at the bottom, I got my little laser pointer, but I'm going to walk up there. Because where does this stuff come from? Google tells you, right? We're going to talk more about citations later. So it's always going to tell you where this data comes from. How long would it take you to go to the U.S. Census Bureau website and find the statistics? Just forget it. Don't even bother, right? You're not going to find it. Um, so Google taps into that some, of that some of the knowledge because what Google's really good at is to index the web and everything that's there. Let's see. Now I might not reach. Okay, stuff about people. So I live in the Crockett Hotel over here. Um, and earlier I was demoing Lucid Chart. I'm just going to throw it out there. You make like Venn diagrams and stuff. And I made one with hot water and water pressure. And then where they overlap, I said, this is what I cannot have at my hotel because it's one or the other. Okay, so Davy Crockett, I don't know much about U.S. history, which is ironic because I was a U.S. history teacher. Because growing up in Sweden, we don't learn about the U.S. Moving here was all like cowboys and Indians. That's it. And 52 states because it's 50 and then Alaska and Hawaii. That was me until t age 22. I'm not kidding, right? So you just type in Davy Crockett. When did he die? Who knows? It shows you, boom, right in the browser. And then on the right, it's going to build that little factoid for you right away. So you don't even have to go to Wikipedia. You don't even have to go to the, the Alamo history site or whatever it is. And then the stuff I was scrolling earlier, see all those search things that came up, the, the green and the black and the blue and stuff? Those are all, you know, Google keeps track of what people search for. So then they say, well, if people search for Davy Crockett, they probably also search for this, or they will probably also search for this, Jim Bowie, and so on and so forth, right? Have you ever been to Amazon? And you bought something, and it says, hey, other people who bought what you bought also bought this. And then they make it really easy for you to click on, right? Google is smart too, right? They know what people search for. There are people with PhDs in computer science at Google that do nothing but study how you search for stuff. And that's how it makes it better and better and better. How about just simple facts, right? Most of your kids go where? And you? Google. And then what's the first website that comes up? Wikipedia. And I love Wikipedia. I tell teachers all the time, I said, Wikipedia is awesome. Because if I need to know how tall or how high my Mount Everest is, Wikipedia is just fine. If I need to know anything about pretty much anything like rocket physics or um, space surgery, Wikipedia is fine for me. I don't need any other source. But obviously, we want to take it a step further, right? And we'll get there later when we talk about citing work. Your students need to know, right? We need to be transparent because it's so easy today to find knowledge. Have you ever thought about this? Is knowledge power? What do you think about that? Is knowledge power? Or is it what we do with it? Because I have all the knowledge I need in my pocket. If you have an iPhone, that iPhone's more powerful than the space shuttle. Space shuttles ran off of 386 computers, if you're that old and know what that is. Um, okay, wait, I want to go back, because Wikipedia, this is not a Google product, right? But why does Wikipedia come up all the time? Why is that the first site that always, like, pops right up? Because people use it. And so the way you get ranked in Google is how much traffic people give to your site, how many people go to that website. Then it's more popular, might be more accurate, right? And uh, the truth about Wikipedia, just as an offshoot in scientific research, it has been proven to be there's a 2% difference between Wikipedia and Encyclopedia Britannica. And Wikipedia is 2% more accurate than Encyclopedia Britannica. 
So no more knocking Wikipedia. Okay. All right, San Antonio Spurs. I'm here. I'm from Cleveland, right? So the whole LeBron business, but I'm not into sports at all. But I know him, right? I don't know him, but he lives in Hudson, like 10 minutes away from me. That's where his family lives. So I've seen him a couple times. So I type in San Antonio Spurs. Again, this was a couple days ago. It gives you the game schedule, and then it gives you all the information that you want, more images if you want their logo, and so on and so forth. Don't even have to go to their website. Just do it all in the browser. Weather, of course. How many of you Google weather all the time? Right? So just weather San Antonio, Texas, like nice. This was a couple of days ago. Today it's up to like, God knows how much, how much right? It's hot. Where does, uh, see the sources at the bottom, Weather Channel, Weather Underground, AccuWeather. Where does weather data come from in the United States? NOAA. The government. Yeah, the NOAA, N-O-A-A.gov. So if you just go to, just bypass all of this, go to NOAA.gov, and that's where the, all of the weather data comes from because the government is the one with all of the measurement stations. Okay, sunrise, if you're an early riser, if you're a jogger, if you're a runner, I am not, so I really don't care about the sunrise, but I was in the military uh, for a while, um, and there it was really important, because if you were going to uh, attack some sort of a target, you do it prior to this. Or you do it like Gandalf. Remember Gandalf in Lord of the Rings? And, you know, the second day you look to the east, and rah, and the Rohirrim come. Do you know what I'm talking about? No. That brings tears to my eyes, by the way, just like, oh. because the Rohirrim are based off of Vikings, and I'm kind of like a Viking-ish type person. So there you go. It'll tell you right there. Um, local time. Again, I'm from Ohio. Now, apparently, I'm not in the eastern time zone anymore. It's so central daylight, save whatever we are. So we're one hour behind. It's like Chicago time. And so for me to just type it, what time is it today? My watch does that for me. But you can do it on your phone. Your phone automatically resets and so on and so forth. Um, but you can do it right in the browser, right? Pop quiz, who's ready? You don't have to shout it out. Where does time zones come from? Yes, okay, so we can't attribute everything to Ben Franklin. <laughs> Almost everything. That's true, but it's from the railroad, right? The railroad, when the rail came to the U.S., they could travel faster than a man on horse. And so it used to be every town had their clock tower, and whenever the sun was straight up, that was noon, and then that it was fine. Things moved a little slower back then. Train came in, and they drove like 30 miles an hour. People thought their soul was going to not be able to keep up, and they thought we need to, to systemize it. How many time zones does China have today? One. Awesome. That's a good system of management, I think. Just We span 13 time zones, but let's just call it one. It's fine. No big deal. Okay, how about foreign time? For those of you who travel around, and I met a couple of chaps from Australia yesterday, and good Lord, they said, well, we left here, and then we actually arrived prior to, or something like that, and that blows my mind. So I just type in time in whatever country it is, and then it'll tell you what time it is there. My dad still lives in Sweden, so I'm always, I got to check. I'm like, all right, so it's 2.42, and my watch is 14.42, just, you know, it's not military time. It's just real time. It's the time that everyone else um, uses. But I have to then, like, okay, plus 6, that's 20, so that's 8 p.m. Okay, so he's not in bed. And then we don't do daylight savings time at the same time as everyone else in the rest of the world. For whatever reason, we still do daylight savings time. So then there's a span of like four weeks when we're, when we're off by like not six hours. Okay, so this helps a lot. Okay, dates of holidays. 2013 Christmas Eve, because you might not know what day of the week that is. So you just type it in, and this year it's going to be Tuesday, December 24th. That's when the real Christmas happens, by the way. And if you're from another country, like up north in Sweden, you get Christmas twice. You get the real Christmas, which is on the 24th, and then the American Christmas on the 25th. So it's double the presents. It's really, really and Our kids love it. Time to open presents. Time to open presents. And then we just repeat, time to open presents. Okay. Calculations. How many of you have a calculator in your desk drawer? How many of your students, especially probably, oh, sorry, at the high school level, has the TI-86-3900 Silver Edition 2? that costs an arm and a leg. I, I have stopped using calculators altogether, even on my phone, because I'm mostly on my MacBook if I'm working. So I just type in 5 plus 2, boom, it brings up a calculator that's plenty scientific for me. Right in your browser. You don't even have to go to somewhere else. You just type it in. In, in my preferred browser, I'm just going to throw it out there, it's Chrome. Um, so here, here comes the biased opinion, right? When you're... Um, when you're done uh, exploring and you're ready to use the internet, then come over to Chrome, okay? Um, so I'm just going to throw that out there. But this works right in Chrome. And, and notice, if you're in Chrome, you know that there's no separate search bar because they just use the Omni box, and so you just type it in right at the top. So 5 plus 2 plus 2, whatever it is that you want. 
I'm going to throw one out too, a bonus one. Wolfram Alpha. Super fan of Wolfram Alpha. If you haven't seen it, if you're a math, science, or any kind of teacher at all, you put your x plus 2 equals 3, y equals 9, or whatever, it'll just graph it for you. Is knowledge power? It's, hot. it's what I do with it because I can calculate whatever it is that I need. Uh, and I'm terrible at math, um, so I need to use some of these tools. Although conversions, I, I'm pretty good at because I was forced to, to do right. 5,280 feet into meters. Who knows? Uh, close. 1609, right? 1,609 meters. Okay, ready for the metric pop quiz? How many centimeters in a meter? 100, because centi is 100, right? How many, uh, how many decimeters in a meter? Good, okay. How many meters in a kilometer? Okay. How many yards in a mile? That's when everyone gets really confused. <laughs> Why do you think our kids have a hard time with math? Because we go from a, an inch that's divided in sixteenths to then 12 inches to a foot, three feet to a yard. No one knows how many yards to a mile because we have to do feet to a mile, and then we have nothing else. Okay, no, yeah? How about Celsius to Fahrenheit? What's Fahrenheit based off of? No one knows. <laughs> what's, ce what's Celsius based off of? Water, right? What sense does it make for water to, to freeze at 32 positive and boil at 212? None whatsoever. Uh, that's something else I had to learn. When you have kids you know, in the US, but what's their temperature? A hundred something, right? I know it's supposed to be 36.5, like normal, but it's not, because then they really freak out. All right, so you can convert all sorts of stuff. Okay, stocks, we're all educators, so we all have extra money laying around, yes? So we invested. So just type in your stock symbol. Obviously, you already know, and you own a bunch of the Google stock. You bought it at the IPO, whatever that stands for initial public offering or something like that. So you look it up here and it's $871. And so if you bought it at the IPO, you make a lot of, a lot of cash. Uh, something to know about stock data. This is true for wherever you go. So unless you pay an enormous amount of money for your stock data, it's always outdated. Okay. Have you seen movies or you remember back to your econ class? And I used to teach econ and your teacher said, they're down there in the pit and they're in raw buy and sell and stock. And that, that doesn't happen anymore. It's all by computers. So computers will make like a million trades in a half a second. And so this data needs to be up to date to get the most amount of money for your, you know, bang for your buck. So the data that you get for free through Google is delayed by 15 minutes, half hour. So just know that. So don't use that to invest your money with. But it's a nice way to kind of figure stuff out and see it and get really good history because you can then go from one day to five days to so on and so forth. How about definitions? How many of your students, when they come to a tricky word on their iPad, and, and, or they don't know how to use their iPad maybe, or they come to a tricky word in that book that you're still using, how many of them get up, traverse the classroom to the dictionaries, and sort of signal to everyone, I don't know what this word means? How many of them do that? None. So in your browser, you just type in define, and then whatever the word is. Define whatever the word is. Polyglot, right? Knowing or using several languages. See that microphone or the speaker? symbol up there? You press that, it'll just pronounce it for you too. So if you ever have a sort of, how do you pronounce this word, sort of struggle, right? You just go to Google, it'll tell you how to pronounce it. There are obviously regional difficulties and differences and things like that, but it works great. How many of you, you use Google Apps at your school? Wow, all right, good for you. I love Google Apps. I use it for 95% of my work, although this presentation is in Keynote, so I feel bad about that, but that's how it goes. Um, <laughs> All right, how about translation? How many uh, foreign language teachers out there? Brace yourself, right? Because this is like the end of your lesson plan. So just type in in real time, like translate the dog ate my homework into whatever language you want, Swedish, and then boom, hunden ot min lexa. That's at 100%. Now, Google Translate is not, you know, it's not a native sitting behind the scenes kind of doing it on the fly. That's what they pay, pay people to do. But it's probably at the 90 to 95%. That's at 100%, and that, but that's a simple, simple sentence, right? Could I get around a country by using Google Translate? Absolutely. Can I bring in a foreign language website to my classroom and have it automatically translate over? Absolutely. How many of you use Gmail as sort of your main email provider? Have you ever gotten an email from a foreign person other than Princes of Nigeria? 
wanting to give you cash money? I always say yes. I'm like, absolutely. I'll forward you whatever you want. Just send me those millions of dollars. But when my uh, Swedish relatives send me email, it always asks me, this email appears to be in a foreign language. It appears to be in Swedish. Do you want me to translate? I always say no, because I'm okay. But you could literally have a conversation. You could have pen pals. Your students could have pen pals in a foreign language, and they type into English. The other kid gets it. It automatically flips it over to their language, and then vice versa. So there's no need to sort of hang out and just spend time in the U.S. alone, right? How many of you are on Twitter? For how many of you have, have Twitter solved the problem and sort of you've connected with people that you just don't know? I was outside having lunch today. I thought, I'm going to crowdsource this baby. I don't know if you've seen the bird yet. It's like a really pretty blue bird with a long beak. It looks like a crow almost, but a little bit more aggressive and strange looking. And so I thought, I don't know what that bird is, but he's really interested in my lunch. So I took a picture of him, and I tweeted. I said, I need help. Who knows what this bird is? And kid you not, within one minute, someone said, oh, that's a grackle. She said, you need to get umbrellas because there tend to be more than one, and they're really aggressive. I was like, okay. So I... But same with Google Translate, right? You don't have to sort of stay in your classroom. You, don't have, you can just expand your borders forever. And those results that you saw earlier, the ones that, that came up here, right? And did you notice how some of them typed in from over here, right to left? You, you can have conversations with people in Arabic. It's no problem. Technology is, is that good today. Is it at 100%? No. Don't write your PhD and then just like translate it into Arabic and say, oh, it's going to be fine. Um, you might double check. Food because we're here in Texas, and I'm from Ohio, and I'm Sweden. We don't even have barbecue at all. We don't know what that is. Like meat, in, if you go to Sweden, just forget it. Don't eat meat. We don't, we don't raise cows. We don't corn feed anything. It's just it's going to be the worst experience ever. So just stick with the fish. You know, anything smoked eel or herring or pickled eel or herring, and you're like, what? Do that. But here, so I thought, I'm going to get some barbecue because I watched it on TV, and now I'm in Texas. So I'm going to have it. So I typed in barbecue restaurant San Antonio and then Riverwalk, right, because I knew I'm sort of here and I can walk to, to there. And then this is what I found, County Line Riverwalk. Who, who's been a County Line Riverwalk? I was there last night. I'm not going to rate it at 21. That's just me. So uh, sometimes they lie. Um, but it brings up sort of a, a little info blurb about the, the place. Uh, pictures, right? So if you take pictures on your phone and you put that out on the, the interwebs and you say this is a picture from County Line, Google's going to find you. It's going to find it and put uh, it's a user picture. Google Map ties right in. Directions, you can write a review. You can now see the Zagat reviews if, if they're available. Super beneficial. I do it all the time. If I go somewhere, I spend some time kind of doing recon or reconnaissance. And that's left over from the old military days. Just kind of finding my way around. Where should I go, eat, and so on and so forth. Drive time. Who uses this? Is anyone like, how long is it going to take me to get to that building? I, uh, for the last two years, I was a, I, I told you I was a consultant. So all of these schools all over Northeast Ohio. So I'm constantly like, okay, 1885 Lake Avenue to whatever, Sheffield schools. And then it would tell me, okay, it's going to take 13 minutes there, right? Good. So here in my example, we got Akron, Ohio to Chicago. You don't have to capitalize any of this. I just did it to be a little bit more polished, I guess. So Akron to Chicago, boom, five hours and 37 minutes. You know that we, we have a two and a five-year-old, so if you're traveling with kids, it's always plus two, right? Because it's like you've got to stop and it's someone needs a break or whatever, mom or dad needs a break or whatever it is. So, but five hours, 37 minutes, it shows you kind of sort of where you go. If you have, if you're the lucky dog and you have the new Google Maps, talk about that a little bit later. Um, it'll even give you stuff like, here are the traffic options. Here, how, here's how long it's going to take if you drove right now, because it ties in traffic data. It knows if it's, there's a jam. And then it'll even tell you how much you're going to spend on gas. It's just, it's just amazing. Now, here's, here's the kicker. Drive time, Akron, Ohio, sit to San Antonio, Texas. You know what it does? It doesn't show me drive time because it says, you're ridiculous. You're not going to go there. So it just brings up flights from Akron Canyon. <laughs> it's true. It's that smart, right? And I'm, I've, I've sort of tried it out. I think it's in the six to seven hour range or like that one day that it's going to take for you to drive. And anything above and beyond that is just going to say, here are the latest flight times. You probably should go do that. I think that's cool. I think that's outstanding. Um, 
It's putting it five hours. That's, that's not how long it takes. Okay. So that's a little bit about sort of what you can just type right into the browser. And you don't have to go to that secondary website. And notice in that flight examples, you don't even have to go to Akron Canton or to that local airport or to the airline or whatever because Google kind of just ranks them. Because they know what you want. You want the cheapest flight with the least amount of stopovers. That's what you want. So that's what they give you. Right? They're not like, here's the most expensive, luxurious, vegetarian option only. And what is with that? Why don't we get food anymore? And I pay for the plane ticket, and then I have to pay for a bag, and then I have to pay extra for food. All right. How do you use search operators? How many of you use search operators? How many of you are like, what is a search operator? Good. All right. That's good. How many of your students know what a search operator is? Yes. All right. Library media specialists? Yeah. Good for you. Um, this is key. We talk a lot about digital citizenship, digi digital leadership, uh, and you're going to hear that all week probably, right? And part of what we need to be good at today, when we graduate students today, K-12, they need to be good at finding information. It is not go you're not getting hired anymore based on what you know in your head. That is not the key. Based maybe, right, how do you find additional information, and then how do you validate that information, right? So if you're searching about how do I build a yurt, what's the best information? And what do I not want to see? So the first one that I use all the time is to remove results. And so the way this works is that you type in your search query, and then you put a, a minus sign, and then right next to the minus sign, you put the term that you want to exclude, that you don't want it to search for. And you're saying to yourself, well, that doesn't make any sense at all. But here in this example, I've searched for spur. And if I just search for spur, guess what's going to come up if I'm in San Antonio? The basketball team, and that's not what I want. So I say spur minus basketball, and then I actually find what I want. The spur on the cowboy spur. That's what I want, right? Does that make sense? Another one is like if you're searching for red puppet and you don't want the really irritating one, you just put minus Alamo. Right, if you're looking for something like that. But it works really well. And remember, all of these search operators you can do in combination with each other. Right. So keep that in mind. You can have multiple minus terms. And so again, every time you put something in Google, you get 63 bazillion search results, regardless of what you search for. Right? There used to be a competition out there that you, any two words that produced under 10 search results, and that's just not possible anymore. So sometimes you have to sit there and whittle your way down. If you Google me, for example, Andreas Johansson, you're going to find that I'm a hockey player or a footballer or a Swedish photographer. But you're not going to find me, right, because there's a lot of people named Andreas Johansson. Here it's really unique. I'm probably the only one at the whole conference with that name. But back home it's like Joe Smith. So in the Internet it doesn't, you know, it's global, so you find it. So minus, spur minus basketball takes me to something not basketball related. All right, next one. Searching within a website. This one is super. And this is, this is the one that your kids don't know. They have no idea how to do this. So they search for whatever, and then they pick the top one result. That's it. And they don't bother if it's a .com or .org or whatever pops up right away. That's what they want. But why don't we limit our search results? So if I know that I want to search only a government website, a .gov, or maybe only you know, CNN.com or Amazon.com, I can use the site operator, so it's site, colon, and then whatever, .gov or Amazon.com or whatever it is that you want to search. And then that limits your search results to only within that type of a website. Does that make sense? So here in my example, I looked for population statistics, site, .gov. Because I have to think to myself, what's the best place? Who's going to have population statistics? Well, the only place that collects it is the census, and so I want the .gov stuff. A little bit about those, right? You and I can go buy ourselves a .com, a .us, a .net, and a .org, but you cannot get a .edu or a .gov. So if you're looking for something that's academia related, right, why don't you just put a site.edu? Because it's not going to be Joe's crazy website designer that shows up because they can't get the EDU. But highlighted in red, you see that both of those, and this goes on, obviously, I just showed you the top there, but then it, all of it is a .gov result. And then you can narrow your stuff down a little bit. Phrases. Sometimes you hear something. Did anyone identify the music we played prior to starting? Does anyone know? Music quiz. 
All right, maybe I'll share at the end. But uh, a lot of the time, if you want to look for a phrase, and what that means is that you're looking for these words in order. So if I'm Googling population statistics, Google's going to show me sites that have population in it. It's going to show me the things that have statistics. And then the ones that they're going to bring up top is where it has both of those words. But they don't appear next to each other, necessarily. If I put it in double quotes, however, it's going to search it in that order. So when you get that paper from your student, and you're like, wow, this doesn't sound like their tone at all. Or how come this paragraph is in Times New Roman size 11, and their other stuff is Times New Roman size 12? <laughs> it's because they acquired it from Wikipedia. So you, just, you can just take that copy paste, throw it in double quotes, and it'll show you the Wikipedia article that it came from. Because now the search results will return only stuff where all of these words are in this precise Order. Close your eyes and I'll kiss you tomorrow. So there you can see that in the video. And I hate to disappoint. It does not play the music like that. So that, that's me. Okay. But it is neat. You could have opened that video and that would have been the music video for the Beatles. But I think you get in trouble for playing the Beatles in public. So we only want to do the first 10 seconds. But stuff that you put in double quotes, it's going to search and return only stuff that is in that specific order. So that's really good. All right, file types. Um, how many of you know what a PDF is? Yes, almost everyone, right? PDFs are great. If you share anything online, make sure it's PDF stuff with students. Because the worst thing you can do is to put your syllabus in a Word document. This is what your syllabus says. It says we don't have school for the rest of the year. It has your stuff on it. So PDF makes it sort of non-editable unless you have a, you know, $6,000 worth of Adobe equipment or something like that. Um, and you can, anything is editable, right? You can acquire anything today. But the file type search operator allows you to search for a specific type of file. So a lot of the time when I look for images, for example, I'll put in PNG. That's a good image format. It's much better than JPEGs or GIFs. Or is it GIF who participated in that debate? Apparently, it's GIF by the maker, like the peanut butter. Okay, so here's what I do. I type in hand washing file type PDF, because what I wanted was a poster, some type of item that I could just sort of borrow and then print, and, and off I go. And notice how Google, too, in the red there, Google doesn't highlight in red. I do. But notice how it tells you in your search results what stuff is in PDF already. So it'll do that if you don't put in the file type. If, if that's a good search result, it'll say this is a PDF. PDFs are typically better for printing, has a higher quality about them. So if you're looking for something specific, you can, you can do that. But it works with any file type. And guess what? You can then use that minus operator. So you can say, I don't want to see PDFs. I don't want to see GIFs. I don't want to see .movs, right? And I only want to see stuff from .govs, or I don't want to see anything from .gov, right? So you can combine all of these. But most of us don't take that time, right? Because we just go to the first thing that comes back to us. So let me share a horror story. Not a horror story, but something that you should know. Probably all the media specialists, you already know, so keep, keep quiet. I used to teach U.S. history, right, and then the obligatory uh, unit on Martin Luther King, which is awesome. But the kids go out online and they search Martin Luther King, and what's the first site that they go to? MartinLutherKing.org. It's a .org. Sounds legit. No problem, right? But you've got to take it sometimes a step further. Who owns MartinLutherKing.org? Yes, yeah, Stormfront. And then if you Google Stormfront, then that's like the number one white supremacist group in the U.S. So that's why you want to know some of these tools. So you can say, well, let me see what .gov sites or .edu sites have about Martin Luther King, right, as opposed to something else. All right. The reading level, um, I might say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you this live here, but... Most of us teach, right, a wide variety, and maybe even you, right? So if you're looking for rocket surgery, you might not need the most advanced stuff about um, rocket surgery. So you can level your search results in Google. And here's what it looks like, and I'll switch over and I'll show you how it works. But searching for Declaration of Independence, I say, well, show me the reading level. And then it gives you a nice graph, so 1958, 24%. And then if you click on those links, it'll send redo it. So it'll show you only the basic or only the advanced or whatever. Here's how you do it. Um, and this is great for working with students because kids in second grade, they don't really need the advanced stuff. They don't need to get into advanced search results. So I'm going to whip over to um, Google here, and we'll search for San Antonio. Nice. 
Now up here in the search tools, see that where I'm at? Click search tools, and then I say reading level under all results, and then it's just going to level the results for me. And then if I click on advanced, I get the advanced articles about San Antonio, and I might go from there. Super handy, depending on what it is that you're looking for, but especially to teach our kids the research skills that they need, right? I do research all the time. You do research all the time. And we don't think of it as a skill that is really necessary, right? How many of you struggle with computers? Some, some of us struggle with computers. I, I fully admit I picked up my Surface tablet the other day, and I have no idea what to do with that thing. The last OS I saw was like Microsoft XP. I, the pushing and the shoving and the flipping and the, I just don't know. So I have to learn how, to, how that works. But uh, imagine the alternative, right? Just don't ever use computer again. Computers are here to stay. So um, we got to teach some of these skills. And this has got to be part of our basic DNA when we at least leave school. How about related? This one you probably won't use that much. But sometimes it's nice to take a website that you have. And for example, if you're building a web quest or building some sort of a repository for your students, and you say, I want to see websites that are related to this one, because this one's really good. So show me stuff that's related. And so what Google does is, and in this case, we do it related to CNN.com. It looks at the link structures of the website, looks at the way the website is set up. It looks at all the different things that that website has going on, because Google crawls it and sort of checks all the data all the time. And then it returns back Fox News, ABC News, NewsYahoo.com, New York Times. All of those websites are related to how CNN.com looks. Does that make sense? That's a good way of finding sites that you never even knew existed. Sort of like when you listen to Pandora. And you're like, I like Swedish House Mafia. What other bands might I like? You know, Dragon Force. I've never heard of that. So, um, yeah. Don't forget Google's advanced search tool. So all of the stuff that we typed in, you know, like San Antonio or Spurs minus a basketball, if you go to the advanced search tool, then it just types it in sort of free space. So this might be a nice place to start, especially with your students. But it's often quicker to know the actual search operators for you later, right? How many of you use keyboard shortcuts at all when you, you navigate? How many of you use shortcuts in Gmail? Do you use the C and the R and the E to archive? Boy, does that speed up your workflow. I come into work, and I got 100 emails. And 10 seconds later, I'm down to 50, because I just triage it, right? Keyboard shortcuts are your friend. Most of us know Control S. That saves at Microsoft, right? You've got to control S, control S, control S. My mom still doesn't know it. Control, yeah, control C, P. But here's the key, right? If you find out what all the keyboard shortcuts are, are you going to know them all and use them all, all the time? No. So learn the ones that really make sense to you, that you do use all the time, and then practice those. It's sort of like how in schools nowadays, we're looking for that one device that's going to solve all of our problems, K-12, iPad, Chromebook. Net, whatever might be, Surface tablet, right? Whatever might be. But is that true about how we actually operate? We're all humans. We're all different. We all do different things. So today I have a, I tweeted it out earlier. I have a MacBook and then I have my phone. I don't have an iPad. I don't bring that iPad with me because it's too heavy. I don't want to lug it around and, right, for what I do. But for what you do and what your students do, uh, that might not be the case. So same thing here. If you're only going to do an advanced search once or twice, then just find the Google Advanced Search. If you're going to do it all the time, then learn the search operators, because that'll be quicker for you. How do you find this, by the way? Just Google it. Just type in Advanced Search, and you'll get right. It's, it's a little bit of a trick question. And speaking of keyboard shortcuts, don't forget Control F. Or if you're awesome and you have a Mac, Command F. You know what that does? That search is whatever you're on. So you have searched for the Alamo, and now you're like, I want to see where Alamo is listed all over the page. Boom. Control F or Command F brings up a little search bar, and that search is then the website. So if you're searching for good emotional quotes from Lord Kelvin on science, but that website's really long, and you're looking for temperature stuff, then you find the website is like 800 pages long. So I just do Control F, temperature. There are the 10 results. That works in a Word document, works in a Google Doc, works in a spreadsheet, works in anywhere you are on your computer. And it's the most underrated search tool there is. 
because it's not good enough to just find the Wikipedia article, right? Because if you go to the Wikipedia article on the U.S. history, it is really long. But if I want to need to find the Alamo in that article, control F, Alamo, there it is. Question? Yeah, command F on the Mac. So command and control are interchangeable on the Mac and PC, so it's just that command is in a much more convenient location by your left thumb. Do you guys ever think about that? You think about design elements and stuff? Like control is over here, so I can't hit it with my left thumb and do an F or a C or a V or whatever it is that I want? All right, never mind. Are we doing on time? Good. Let's talk about Google Drive, because this is 30-plus tools, and I think we're already above 30 or so, or hope 27, thank you. And we're not even close to being done, so i got to speed up. And I have a number down here, I think, for everyone's benefit, but I think we're going to run. And then there's a bonus section. we got to get to that mantis shrimp, because that'll blow, it'll blow you away, I think. I took a day off. Sort of like when I found out that gravity doesn't pull. I see some of you fur you're furling your eyebrow. You're like, gravity, you know, I grew up, I'm like, okay, Newton dropped the apple, center of the earth pulls the apple towards the center. And then what it actually is, the reality, is that it's the way that space bends like a fabric around the earth that creates a push factor, and that's gravity. And then I took a day off. That's it. We're done for the day. It blew my mind. Did you know that? So some of you are sitting on textbooks that are still calling gravity a pull, for, you know, and it's not. Okay, Google Drive. Most of you, a lot of you have Google Apps, so I'm just going to go through it kind of quickly because you, you're, you know what I'm talking about. But you might not have seen some of this stuff. Obviously, in Google Drive, we can share. That's a whole different workflow, right? And you know what I'm talking about if you're working in Google. And if you're still on that Microsoft or the other system, right, where if I have to send something over to Brianne, and Brian, you know, I'm going to send you a document, so I compose an email, and then I attach the document, and I pray to God, I hope she has Microsoft so that she can open up the file, and I send it to her, and she can make her edits. But if I'm going to work on a project with this whole front row, then all of a sudden I have lots of different files coming back to me, and some of my students send it back in like Word Perfect, <laughs> which on a three and a half inch disk. I said it's. 2011. I just I don't know what to do with this. Um, so the major the major construct of Google Docs or Google Drive is that you share stuff, right? So instead of me attaching something and sending it to you, I just attach you to the item, and then we're always on the same page. Literally, what are the limits? How many people can I have edit a Google document at the same time? One hundred, right? I can have 10 people edit a presentation at the same, same time. How many of your students struggle with PowerPoint, flash drive? You have to accept a flash drive from them, and God knows what's on that flash drive. Which file is it? I don't understand. It doesn't play off the flash drive. And Google, I just share it with the teacher, and the teacher says, oh, I see your work. Psh, pulls it up. Off you go. Total security. I have total control over who sees what at any time. If I email that file over to Brianne, Brianne can do whatever she wants. She sends it to the rest of the world. I have no control over that. Google Apps, at any time I get my list. Shelly, I don't like you. I'm going to just take you off the list. Shelly's nice. I'm not going to do that. But, you know, Larry. I don't really know Larry. Are you in the room, Larry? You might be. I don't know. But if Larry, does, go ahead. That's you? No, that's you can. But I would not recommend you video files up in Google Drive. Um, now the latest, though, if you're on a Google Apps domain, you have 30 gigabytes of shared storage. So that is a, a lot. Uh, and if you're on a Gmail, then you have 15 gigabytes of shared storage. So that's a lot of cloud storage for you. But videos, if I shoot a, a one-minute video on my iPhone, that's pretty much a gig. And that's a lot of data. So I, I'm hesitant in, in throwing up video. The, the better way there is to just upload it, put it on YouTube, send people the link to YouTube, and make the video private if, if that's what you want to do. So sharing is easy. The, you probably feel, I'm probably feeling the love, right? You, you like the sharing? Does that change your world? My wife is a copywriter and, and editor. Go ahead, sir. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. So what it'll do, it'll convert it. So it'll convert it into, so it'll take your Microsoft document and convert it into a Google Doc format, and then it's, you're, it's clean. You're, you're good to go. Yeah. 
So my wife is a copywriter and editor. She, they have not embraced this yet because she works for a bunch of companies like all over the world. And they do the PDF thing. It just gives me a headache. They have a full-time person that's called the trafficker, which sounds highly illegal. But all they do is they make sure that this version is right and that version matches and the document goes to the person that is sh I'm like, why don't you just share and then you're always on the same, right? Speaking of which, right, you can put in comments in a Google Doc. So instead of um, in the school that, or the mode that you're using in school today with maybe language arts or whenever the kids write something, they make their first draft, they print it out for some reason, they give it to you, and it's double space times New Roman so that you can leave comments and stuff, right? And then they get it back, and then they give you the final version. And all we do is two revisions. Here, you just start commenting right away. So you tell the kids, you say, hey, I want your intro paragraph tonight. And then I'm going to leave some formative feedback to you in the form of comments. And then the students can comment back. And we'll say, I really like the way I wrote it. I don't want to change it. And it's all tracked. So when you bring mom and dad and you can say, well, here's all the feedback I left for Joey. Joey chose to do all of it. And he went from a C- minus to an A because he's awesome. And here's Susie who just didn't give it give a hoot and didn't take any of my suggestions and didn't participate in editing at all and it didn't go so well. And you know what the cool part is, right? The whole workflow of turn in your rough draft and then your final and we're done, that's not how the real world works. Back to my wife, the copywriter. You know how many times they go back and forth between her and the client? Too many. Sometimes it's 40, 50, 100 times. She wrote an ad for Ford Motor Company. The gist was, if you buy a Ford filter, you get a free T-shirt. They spent 15 hours working on that. 15. You know what the, uh, the final text was? Buy a Ford genuine oil filter, get a free T-shirt. <laughs> At $200 an hour. That was during the whole recession thing, too. So I was like, I'm paying for that. Where's my free T-shirt? But that's real life. Real life is editing. Real life is not do two things and we're done and call it a day. Real life is editing. And why not invite a peer editor, right, at the same time? And, and get it on and produce some of the best writing that the students will ever be able to produce. And then it's all there. You can research from right within. So instead of even going to a new tab and opening it up and then going to Wikipedia, you know what happens in Google Docs? If I search for Shakespeare, I drag Shakespeare's picture into the document. It automatically cites it for me at the bottom in MLA, APA, or CPA. I'm sorry, language arts teachers, but you don't need to spend two weeks on MLA because no one uses it past English 11. What? It automatically cites it for you. Yeah, or anything that you search. So this is just an image search. So if I just take that, I like, like the top left one. That's what I'm going to use in my writing or whatever as an example. Drag it in. It automatically superscripts it with whatever the number is. And then at the bottom puts a footnote. And you can choose between MLA, APA, and CPA or something like that. Into a Google document, yeah. It is now. That's a good question. So, yeah, is that? <laughs> yes. Now. No, it's been, it's been a couple of weeks. But the tricky bit is that it, depending on your Google Apps domain, if you are not on the, what's called a rapid release cycle, your school might not have it. So if you're on the, what's called a scheduled release, you're a little bit behind, and so you're going to have it eventually. And that's just because they don't want to push out everything to everyone at the same time. So get with your apps administrator. Say, we need rapid release. Thank you very much. Right away. But yes, it's, go ahead, question. Just to search for like text in there? Yeah, so click, you click on tools and then research. And there's tools and define too. So again, you don't have to leave your document. You just say, what does this word mean? And you get a definition. And pl let's stay afterwards and kind of play with that and I'll show you more in detail if, if you want. You can collect data at Google Forms. I love Google Forms. If you have any Google Forms questions, come see me. I love to uh, collect data that way. How many of you are doing uh, SLOs? Does that even, is that anyone outside the state of Ohio? Maybe, I don't know. Yes. So we have to collect all this data about our students so we can write proper, you know, like plans for them. Collect it in Google Docs, Google Forms. What do you like? What's your learning style? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I could go on with Google Forms forever. Revisions. Remember we said Control-S? 
Control S, right, to save stuff. You don't have to save anything in Google Docs. And then it saves everything you do. So all 10 people that you have editing your document, when Joey gets really mad because he hates group work and deletes the whole document, you just restore it to right before Joey deleted the document, and on goes your day. I'm going to speed up a little bit. You can standardize stuff. If you're using Google templates for your organization, your school, just put up whatever. You know, Here's the scientific formula or scientific method. Put that up as a template. Everyone has access. Everyone can use it. Standardize. Here's the mileage expense form. Here's how we fill out um, detentions, whatever it might be. And don't forget, Google Mail, Calendar, Groups, Hangouts, Google+, Sheets, and Presentations. Because you have all of that, too. It's all free. It's all awesome. Stop by the Google booth all this week. Um, I'm going to put in a promo. If you want to learn more about Lucidchart, I think I mentioned that's 2 p.m. on Wednesday. I'll be there. Okay, some other Google tools, because he's telling me to speed up. Google Trends, that's what I showed you earlier. Google Trends looks at what is being searched for in real time and displays it to you. So that's a real nice pulse checker on the planet. So a while ago, right, it was Amanda Bynes. Is that her name? Amanda Bynes and then Selena Gomez. And this is like in the popular trend or whatever. But you can go in there and filter and do whatever you want. And it's at google.com forward slash trends. Um, if, you know, if you show up to class on a Friday and you're like, I don't have to take a slow day, find Google Trends and just start your conversation. What is going on right, in the world? Because you can switch between U.S. and world and global. Public Data Explorer. Again, we talked about census records. You're not going to go to the census and get the data that you want. Google taps into the public data that's available and allows you to graph it. You can change axes. You can do whatever you want. You can pit child poverty against education level, whatever you want. Price of milk in schools versus crime rate. And it'll just graph it for you. Off you go. Because we all know that when I can see data visually, it's much more understandable. If I have to look at numbers in a table, forget it, right? And guess what one of the common core skills is? It's to understand that there's an actual relationship between the numbers in that table and the map and the picture, right? And so practice, because you can get the raw data, too. Search by images. I, if I had thought about it, for that grackle bird, I could have taken a picture, thrown it in, and Google allows you to search using an image as the stimulus. So instead of me searching you know, native Texas bird that looks really weird, if I had a picture, I'd just drag it into the Google image search, and it'll search the internet for other images that looks just like it. And then I can probably find what I want. Right. Yeah, so if you have it. Yeah, so she said a copyright image, right? If you have a, a, you know, same thing like you're searching with that phrase. If you have an idea that maybe it's not a legitimate picture, search using the picture and you'll find other pictures that look just like it. Images.google.com. Come on. Google Voice. How many of you use Google Voice? I call Sweden all the time. I pay two cents a minute. You could set up your own number. How many you teach foreign languages? Have the kids call that number and leave their dictation for whatever language it is. And then you just listen to it. You can have parents call in. It dictates it to you and sends you the message in an email. Mrs. So-and-so just called. Here's what they said. And then you can play it if you need to or not, right? But it just writes it all out, transcribes it. Free. doesn't cost anything. Um, outstanding. Google Translate we talked about at translate.google.com. You just paste in a bunch of text that's going to say, I think it's this language. What language do you want it in? And then the next step over here, right, you can see with the laser there maybe, that button, click it and it reads it to you. So if you have parents, if you're in a bilingual district or if you're in a multilingual district and you have parents that have a really hard time, just take your documents that they need, put them in Google Translate, give it back to them, they'll understand what it means. Right? Your son or daughter has to show up on time for school or whatever it might be, Google Translate. Google Alerts, you should probably have an alert about yourself so that when you become part of the Google search sort of results, it'll send you an email. Or put in your school, especially if you're an admin, if you're an administrator, put in your school, you know, like, sh and shooting or something like that so that you get an email right away. Let's talk about the Chrome browser. We'll make it. We're good. we got seven minutes. How many don't use the Chrome browser? Okay, start. You, you still have a chance. If you have that Microsoft tablet, for some reason it doesn't run Chrome, so... So I don't understand why, but that's okay. So the Chrome browser, here's a couple of things you can do. More than one can play. Who gets really irritated because you have more than one account, and when you want to go into that other account, you have to sign out and then sign in, and you spend hours signing out and signing in. 
in Google Chrome, you just add those new accounts and you hot switch that bad boy whenever you want to. So at work, this, is, this was like early on, right? I have my work, my personal, and then a bunch of other schools. And if I need to get into the Lorraine apps, if I need to go, get into ODCS or back to work, I just boom, 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 click. I'm signed into all of them, and it's awesome. And I just switch between the windows because Google Chrome handles everything in what's called a sandbox environment. So it doesn't talk to each other. It's great. Pin the tab. You know how we have 63 tabs open? You can't read them. But some of the tabs like mail, drive, Google search, and calendar, you're always going to have there. So you right click on the tab and you say pin the tab. And then it turns small like that. And then they don't take up space. Because you know what that symbol means, right? You can drag it. So if you have a tab and you want it on your big monitor, you just drag that tab over. Or you drag it back in and make it part of another window. Whoops. How many of you have closed the tab? Control W, by the way, right? Control or Command W closes the tab. And you're like, I wish I, what was that tab? Control Shift T or Command Shift and T opens up the tab that you just closed. Awesome. Oh, it doesn't accidentally. That does close. That does close. Yeah, Control W closes a tab or Command W. Control T opens a tab, right? And then Control Shift T opens up the tab that you just closed. Nice. How about this one? We're going to say it's because you want to go and shop for your kids and you don't want them to get on the computer right after you and figure out what you bought for them on Amazon. So you use an incognito window in Chrome. And if you're an incognito window, it doesn't keep anything about your browsing history at all. So whenever I get on a computer that is not physically mine, I am in incognito mode because then when I close the window, all of that history goes out. I was volunteering yesterday as a tech ninja. We had people come up to print out their forms for the Surface tablet. You know, can I print, log into your email? And then they're like, okay, bye, we'll see you. I stepped around. I was like, I own your email, but I'm a kind person, so I will just sign up for you. If you're in an incognito window and you close that window, you're good. You're, you're set. I can't get in behind you. If you're on any public computer, if the kids are on any computers, they're not there. So they sh if they're in the lab, Media specialists, if they're in your lab, they should be in an incognito window session, right? Unless you have a Chromebook and they're signing into their, their session or something like that. So control plus shift plus N. You can't do it on any kind of tablet business. What, if you do have an iPad, you can uh, click on that thing and say open an incognito window. So you, but you can't do it with the keyboard combination. Yeah. And then that's separate from your other windows too. So when you do private browsing in Firefox and Explorer, then everything else closes, right? This is just a separate thing. It doesn't keep track. Okay, bonus round. Let's go. Yes, there it is. Okay, you know how we have, and so this is the quick story. And I'm, the, the, what I'm showing you is how to find good images because we all do it. That's the mantis shrimp. Um, you know how we have uh, three cones in our eyes to see color, whatever they are? Butterflies have like five cones. Mantis shrimp, 16. They can see colors we don't even know exist, literally, right? The other thing they do is they kick with their front paws, and they actually make water boil because it's so fast, and so you can't keep it in an aquarium because it would break the glass. That's the mantis shrimp. Okay, so how do we find this image? So we go to Chrome, and here's what people do, right? So they say mantis shrimp. Everyone loves mantis shrimp. And then you click on Google Images, right? Because, and your kids do this all the time. They're like, oh, look at those images right there. But then I, I hover over, and like this one here, nice, 500 by 333. That's going to look horrible in my PowerPoint presentation, right? So you need something that's over 1,000 or like maybe 2,000 by, by whatever the dimension is. So can I do that? Sure. Here's how you do it. Just like in our reading level, you just say search tools, size, larger than, 6 megapixels or whatever it is that you want. And now, right, behold... Now, that takes a while to load because that's a lot of data. But behold a nice uh, image of the mantis shrimp. Because your kids do it and you do it. You find an image and it's 400 by 200. And then you stretch it in that PowerPoint and everyone's like, oh, no. Did you catch that? I'll be here all day. So you can ask later how to do it. Okay. That's the mantis shrimp. Now for some more uh, serious stuff. 
There's a whole article, by the way, in the resource about the mantis shrimp that you should read. The new Google Maps, if you haven't signed up for it, and this is sort of like that app's domain rapid release business, uh, they release things to, to only some people. So I signed up early on. The new Google Maps is awesome. This is down, downtown. The map interface is nice. Um, and then they drop sort of a 3D look. It's like flying through downtown. And we're here, right? We're like over here somewhere. Right? But there's the tower. But see the shadow of the tower? It's amazing. And then if you've used Google Earth, the new Google Maps, when you're in satellite view, just comes all the way out to Google Earth. And what a beautiful way that is to understand that we're actually a globe or like some sort of a spheroid, right, instead of just a flat map. Most of my students had a really hard time understanding when, uh, why we have all of our nuclear missiles in North and South Dakota. They're like, it's really far from Moscow shooting it over the Atlantic. Well, we were a globe, right, so we shoot it over the poles. But unless you see that, then it's hard to understand. Okay, so that's the new Google Maps. Hangouts on air, how many of you have done them? Google Hangouts on air, awesome. Here's me with non-flattering picture um, in a session with 14 other educators. Me and 14. So if you're in a Google Apps, you can do a total of 15. If you're on your private stuff, it's you and nine friends. Uh, yeah, for, for your own, like a Gmail account, it's 10 total. For Google Apps, it's 15 total. Or Google Apps for edge or business. But what a great way to have PD. And then we recorded it and live streamed it on YouTube at the same time. And then it's there and they can go back and watch. It's outstanding. It's awesome. Google News, I don't know. People harp about this whole Google Reader business. I was never into Google Reader. I just go to Google News. It'll show me the news that's important to me. Um, consume it that way. Here's some fun words. If you're in a browser right now, maybe type in askew, recursion, do a barrel roll, find out the bacon number of my cousin, Scarlett, right, and see how far away she is from Kevin Bacon. And it'll just do it for you. And then maybe, who did it? Someone did it? I wish she was my cousin. Define, no, that's even, that's even weirder. Um, define anagram, and it'll give you something funny. Those are just some what's called uh, hidden Easter eggs. But do a barrel roll is fun. And then Zerg invasion is a good time, too. Just get ready. Thanks for being here. I appreciate it. Um, here's me. Here are all the resources, including this presentation. More on the mantis shrimp and more on all of the different search stuff and everything that we've talked about today. Bitly, it's case sensitive, so it's bit.ly forward slash AJO for Andreas Johansson. And then ISTE is all caps, right? So I'll leave that up as we leave. Play some music. It's 3.30 or 15.30 um, if you're playing along somewhere else. Thanks for coming. Enjoy the rest of your conference. Go forth. Thank you.